two of my favorite things. So um, it's a beautiful Bahada morning, and in Bahada we say Dara Dara Chu uh, to say good morning. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you today, this morning, to launch um, Professor Paul D. Williams' book, Fighting for Peace in Somalia, a history and analysis of Amazon from 27 to 2017. My name is Anna Zadek, and I'm the director of global policy at the Life and Peace Institute. We are an international peace building organization working in the Gulf of Africa and the Great Lakes. And in Somalia, we support a related endeavor to that of Amazon, but something much more on the local level. So we support local level suicide led peace and reconciliation efforts in South Central and in Jordan. So I'm very interested in today's topic because it's, you know, AU's longest, most expensive, most complex peace support operation, and sadly also the deadliest. So it's tremendously worthy of the investigation, and it's something also that the Somali community are very concerned about. So the centerpiece that we are gathered around here today is this book, Fighting for Peace in Somalia, a history and analysis of Amazon, also in 2017. And this book was selected as Anna Forrest 2019 annual winner and a significantly advanced scholarship on African peace operations as the first comprehensive, independent assessment of its evolution, progress, challenges during that 10 year period. We do have some very limited copies of the book to give away, courtesy of Paul and Oxford Press. Thank you very much. And I'll share towards the end of the session on how we plan to share this scarce resource. The format for our discussions will be the following. Paul will present his main arguments and findings in his book for the next 20 minutes, and then we'll have Professor Charles Mukherjee as a discussant to provide his reflections on the topic, and then we'll give we'll people the remaining time for some rapid fire Q&A with all of you. So um, let me turn to introduce our speakers. Um, our main speaker, Professor Paul Lee Williams, is an associate professor of international affairs at the Elliott School of International Affairs at George Washington University in Washington, D.C. He's been associated with the International Peace Institute in New York and with the Woodrow Wilson Center in D.C. And in 2011 to 2014, he was also here in Ethiopia as a visiting professor at the Institute for Peace and Security Studies at Adelaide University. And our discussion, Professor Charles Kendrick, is a professor of international relations at Obafemi Alvaro University of Nigeria. And he was also previously at IPSS as a senior advisor. And he also served with Anapor in several senior positions for the last few years. And you can find their extended bios in your resource pack. So without further ado, I'll close doors. Good morning, everyone. Um, first of all, I would just like to thank uh, Tana Forum for basically I feel very humbled and honored to be invited here to come and talk to you today about a book that has taken me almost as long to write as the Amazon mission has uh, been in existence. I've been following Amazon for about 12 years now. In fact, Probably a bit longer when EGAD was first debating and wanted to set up a peace operation in 2005. So I feel I've lived a long time with this uh, mission. And it's very, um, uh, I'm humbled today to be able to talk to you a little bit about this this book. And so thank you very much to the, the TANA Forum and organizers, and of course the selection committee for choosing uh, my book to, to talk about today. Um, Amazon, as we've already heard, I think, is a, is a crucial mission for many, many different reasons. I'm a professor who studied peace operations for over 20 years now, and depending how you count them, there are at least 200 peace operations in the world since 1948 through to where we are today. And I can say without a shadow of a doubt, I've studied all of them in some degree. And Amazon is by far the most complicated, complex, extraordinary operation of all of them. So it was important, I think, that somebody might uh, talk about this extraordinary mission. And that's what I've uh, tried to do. I'll let you be the judges of whether I've succeeded uh, or not. But I want I want to start the talk on a more sort of um, depressing note, I suppose, and the, the book is, a, is both the history of the mission and then a, a look to the future and a, a, an assessment of its major operational challenges. 
And so for the history part, I want us to go back right to the first few days of when Amazon was established. This was the 6th of March, 2007. Uh, roughly 1,605 Ugandan soldiers that formed the first battle group arrived in Mogadishu at the beginning of March 2007. Is that better? Okay, we'll try again. Um, I wanted to start off basically at the beginning of Amazon and take our minds back before we look to the, the future. Uh, in early March 2007, 1,605 Ugandan soldiers who formed the first battle group of Amazon arrived into Mogadishu. And on the very first day when they were holding their uh, ceremonial parade of uh, arrival, they came under water fire from uh, unknown assailants in Mogadishu. On day two of their operations, one of their patrols was uh, ambushed and an IED was set off to attack the peacekeepers. And the slide I put up here is from just three days after their arrival, on the 9th of March, uh, a cargo plane that was bringing supplies in for the mission was hit by a, a rocket propelled grenade. And uh, at the time, after this plane had been hit and the uh, Amazon had been under fire for the, all of its first few days, the force commander at the time, Levi Karahunga from uh, Uganda, he said, when the plane was here, we thought, oh, this is mission impossible. And I think it's important to start there, and that's where the book starts, in effect, is that for many people, Amazon was considered mission impossible. It was being sent not to a, a peaceful zone, it was being sent to the middle of a war zone in Mogadishu, with a whole lot of different armed factions fighting, and for many people, this was not the place to send peacekeepers. Now, as we know, historically, uh, Amazon didn't turn out to be mission impossible, but it did turn out to be mission very, very difficult in many respects. Now, it's a bit difficult for you to see the slide here, but the first few weeks of Amazon's operations started with the troops fanning out to four locations in, in Mogadishu. They arrived at the international airport, obviously. They then had to secure the seaport. Uh, that was crucial to get their armored personnel vehicles and logistics supplies through. They also, because of their mandate to support the transitional federal government, had to set up a base in the Villa Somalia. And in order to drive from the airport to get to Villa Somalia, they also had to take over control of a kilometer four junction. As you see here, the four areas where Amazon started. It's important to remember, as one of the force commanders told me as well, Amazon starts life as the insurgents. It's Al-Shabaab and some Ethiopian forces, but Al-Shabaab in particular that occupies the majority of Mogadishu at this time, and it's Amazon that feels like the insurgents making these small little footholds into the city and trying to expand. Now we know if we fast forward from 2007 right the way through now to about 2015, you can see a map here of what the mission looks like in early 2015, and you can see a very different story. Now Amazon is over 20,000 soldiers and, and police. It's got two contributing countries from half a dozen African states. It's deployed across most of South Central Somalia. And what my book does in effect in the first part is to tell the story of this remarkable history of how Amazon went from a tiny mission in just four parts of one town to uh, a large operation covering the whole of South Central Somalia. Why did I write this book? Um, as Hannah's already mentioned, for a, a couple of reasons here. You can't understand the African Union and its evolution uh, with regards to peace and security without understanding Amazon. Amazon, as we've heard, is the longest, uh, most expensive and largest AU operation, so it's crucial that we understand it in that sense. Secondly, from 2017, it also became the world's largest peace operation as the missions in Congo and uh, Darfur started to draw down. Sadly, it's also been the most deadly peace operation in modern history as well. And if you put all these things together, Amazon has been a key case for understanding the wider debates about peace operations. If you want to understand how to do counterinsurgency, stabilization, counterterrorism, Amazon is the crucial case study for us to get our, our heads around. And the final reason is because, sadly, my academic colleagues, nobody else was writing this book, and so I took it on myself to try and do as good a job as I can. Now the book is in two parts. Uh, the first half of the book tells the historical story of how Amazon uh, evolved uh, from 2007 to 
1997 until its first 10 years through mid-2017. And here the book tells the story in a fairly arbitrary set of stages about how Amazon arrived with this small mission in Mogadishu and expanded uh, to the 20,000 plus troops that it is uh, today. And then in the second part of the book, after examining the history, I look at the major operational challenges that this mission faced. And for each of these challenges, I try and draw out some of the lessons for wider peacekeeping debates and operations. Uh, number one challenge is about logistics supply. How do you fight a war without logistics? It's very difficult. Security sector reform is the story of working with the Somali National Army and the security forces. Civilian protection is number three. Strategic communication is number four. How to stabilize South Central Somalia is challenge number five. And the exit strategy debate was challenge number six. And what I would like to just do briefly with the rest of my time is to run through just a little bit of detail each of those major challenges. The first one is logistics. And this is a story really about how Amazon is not able to sustain itself logistically in terms of rations, uh, everything from electricity generation, medical supplies, engineering. And in the logistics chapter, it's really the story of how a partnership was forged between the United Nations and the African Union to deploy an unprecedented mechanism in the form of the UN Support Office for Amazon, which delivered logistics support from 2009 onwards. Sadly, though, the problem here was that these UN logistical arrangements were designed for a world of peacekeeping whereas Amazon was a war-fighting operation. And so every military commander I've interviewed for this book told me you must never separate a military commander from their logistics and expect positive results in warfare. But this is exactly what we did in Amazon. And so we had a whole lot of logistical challenges to overcome. The second big challenge that Amazon faced was about security sector reform. There was no exit strategy for Amazon unless Somalia's own army and security forces can stand up and take on the major responsibilities. So this chapter is a story of how Amazon has to build trust with a very fractured and, um, and fragmented set of Somali security forces. There's an army in name only. Instead, there are clan militias, former rebel actors, Darwish, and other types of uh, armed groups that are cobbled together to form a Somali army. And Amazon has to develop a, a sense of trust, an operational trust with these forces, which proved very difficult over the years. As I put up here, the key to doing this well is political. It's impossible to build a national Somali army if Somali politicians don't agree on what their nation is and haven't reconciled politically. And so Amazon's job was very difficult for those reasons. The third big challenge was civilian protection. And this may sound odd because, for those of you who will know, Amazon has never had an explicit mandate to proactively protect civilians. The trouble is, that doesn't matter to most ordinary Somalis. Most ordinary Somalis still expect protection from Al Shabaab and other armed groups, regardless of the, the nuances and, and fine words that are written in the, the mandates of the mission. And so this chapter is the story of how Amazon had to overcome the, uh, the challenges of being expected to provide protection, but because it didn't have a mandate to do this, it didn't have the resources and capabilities to do this effectively. Strategic communications. This was really the story of how Amazon engaged in the propaganda wars uh, against its primary opponent, uh, Al Shabaab. And here is a, a rather, I think, overall depressing tale in that, sadly, the mission was never given the capabilities to actually enact a campaign of strategic communications early on. And so this was a story of having to, again, make it up as we go along. Again, a compromise was forged between the United Nations and a set of private um, contracting firms that formed an unprecedented mechanism called the Information Support Team. And from 2009 onwards, these firms provided Amazon with some strategic communications capabilities, but it still had to wage this propaganda campaign against al-Shabaab, and that has proved very difficult for a number of reasons, as we've seen. Uh, at the heart of this problem was not everything al-Shabaab said was a lie or untrue. The Somali transitional government and federal governments were weak, they were considered illegitimate by many segments of the local population, and they were corrupt. And so on that basis, al-Shabaab was able to make inroads, and Amazon had to combat those narratives. The penultimate challenge is about stabilization. Uh, when Amazon moves out of Mogadishu in 2011, 
and 2012, the mission stops being just an urban warfare operation and becomes more about stabilization. How can we deliver a peace dividend to the populations that we've recovered from Al-Shabaab control? And here again, this is a chapter that tells the story of the challenges that a very military heavy mission like Amazon faces. And ultimately, Amazon proved, uh, it proved very difficult for Amazon to deliver a peace dividend to local populations because ultimately this relied on local security forces to fight such um, things as governance, administration, humanitarian relief. And because the Somali governments were quite weak and not able to do this in many places, many of the towns and settlements that Amazon recovered did not really succeed in delivering a peace, a peace dividend and stabilization to their um, local uh, inhabitants. And the final challenge is exit, and we discussed this extensively last night on the, the panel. But of course, from day one, Amazon has always had to think about how it's going to leave Somalia. Amazon is not meant to be a, an occupation uh, mission. It's not meant to be there indefinitely. So how does one leave? And this is a fine balancing act between, on the one hand, providing a security blanket for local actors to develop and build up their capacities, but on the other hand, we don't want Amazon to become a crutch on which Somali uh, security forces rely, and it becomes an unhelpful sort of um, counterproductive presence. So this chapter tells the story of how Amazon has rethought its exit strategy. From in, in day one, uh, the idea was going to be to hand over to a UN peacekeeping mission in, um, and within six months. Obviously, 12 and a half years later, that has not panned out. So the exit strategy now is about how can we build up and hand over to Somali security forces. Now just to, to finish with those two, um, with those sets of challenges, just a couple of major arguments uh, about the sort of pros and cons or the challenges and, and successes of the mission. Uh, on the one hand, first, the major problems. Amazon suffered from a variety of challenges over these last 12 years. The first one was that it lacked really what I would call unified command and control. It's been very difficult for 12 years for the force commanders to really exercise operational control over their sectors. Uh, this is a story largely of national contingent commanders taking the lead in, in operations. And so the mission has struggled to be more than the sum of its um, parts. The second major challenge Amazon has is that there was Amazon on paper and there was Amazon in reality. And Amazon on paper was a well-resourced mission with lots of people and lots of resources to do with medical support, engineering, ISR, even special forces and the like. In practice, however, we fail to generate a lot of the capabilities and key assets. One key example would be aviation. Amazon was authorized to have 12 military helicopters in 2012, and yet Amazon didn't get a single military helicopter under its command until December of 2016. And I can think of no other major operation in the world that we would deploy so many peacekeepers without any of their own aviation support. This denied them the ability to strike at depth quickly against Al-Shabaab. And so it's just one example of how force generation was, was problematic. Um, as a result of this, Amazon has struggled to really destroy Al-Shabaab's key capabilities. Instead, we've tended to displace and dislodge Al-Shabaab from different areas. But that's not the same thing as destroying their key capabilities. And that was because, in essence, so Amazon was a slower operation and Al-Shabaab's forces were often faster. And so we saw a sort of game of military cat and mouse develop uh, across South Somalia for many years. A fourth challenge is to do with the perceived um, political interests of the neighboring states. And in particular, um, Somalia opinion polls of Somali um, uh, inhabitants have shown fairly consistently negative views, particularly about um, the frontline states' arrival in the mission. So with Uganda and Burundi just on their own in Mogadishu, the mission grew, I would say, quite um, uh, high in terms of local levels of legitimacy. As it expanded and more frontline states appeared, tensions started to appear with the local uh, population. And finally, issues of civilian harm, misconduct, sexual exploitation and abuse and corruption have bedeviled the operation for a number of years. And then finally, to finish, on a more positive note, because I do ultimately think Amazon has delivered a lot of important successes, uh, it's going to be impossible for you to read this slide I see now, but here are some of the main achievements, basically. There are six that I want to finish on. We must remember the history. First of all, Amazon enabled the Ethiopian forces to leave Mogadishu. 
Ethiopian forces in Mogadishu until January 2009 were a lightning rod for Al-Shabaab's recruitment campaign, and allowing them to leave was Amazon's first major success. Secondly, Amazon has now protected two iterations of the transitional federal government in Somalia, and I think it's fair to say without Amazon, we wouldn't have had a, a transitional federal government in charge of that city. Uh, thirdly, Amazon succeeded in expelling Al-Shabaab's forces from Mogadishu in August 2011. Fourthly, it then subsequently from the end of 2011 through till about 2014, Amazon helped recover about 30 different towns and, and settlements from Al-Shabaab. And although it had problems of stabilization, as I've mentioned, we shouldn't forget that fact. Uh, a lot less territory is now controlled by Al-Shabaab because of Amazon's efforts. Um, fifth, we shouldn't forget as well that Amazon has helped the process of establishing what are now called the federal member states in Somalia, what used to be the interim regional administrations. Somalia cannot have a system of federal government if we don't have regional members to work with the federal government, and Amazon was a crucial part of helping to establish those entities. And finally now, since we've seen Amazon protect and help secure the elections that have led to two federal governments, permanent governments in Somalia. All in all, therefore, I think to finish, it's important that we remember Amazon has provided what I would call the sort of security blanket, which has enabled most international actors to turn up in Mogadishu. Without Amazon, we wouldn't see the diplomatic and humanitarian community that we have. And so uh, I'll end there and look forward to your uh, questions and Charles uh, to discuss. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paul, for sharing the broad outlines of your book and the main insights in it. Uh, six achievements and six challenges is a very nice symmetry to it. Uh, let me now turn to Charles. In 10 minutes or less, based on your knowledge of other peace operations on the continent, what are your thoughts on Paul's conclusions? Um, thank you very much, Anna. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, let me state up front that um, it's not my intention to review a 365 page book uh, that took 9 10 years to write. Uh, in just 10 minutes, uh, I believe that the intention of the Internal Secretariat uh, was put to have us um, to wait to advertise this morning, not just for breakfast, but also for the book. So I do not wish to stand between you and the realization of uh, both intentions. <laughs> Let me start by thanking Paul um, on behalf of all of us for this refreshing, um, very balanced, very comprehensive, and very authoritative accounts of Amazon engagements in Somalia, starting from 2005 um, up to the middle of uh, 2017. Um, reading, reading this book, I could see clearly that um, Paul was not afraid to, to get into difficult um, debates. Uh, we call them puzzles. Uh, for instance, uh, why do countries provide PC bus in the first place? It might sound very ordinary, but it's very, very important. It is the fact that the heart of whether or not a peace operation will succeed. Um, should external internal putters provide support to troops from the between countries, despite the economic, political, and security risks that come with it? How and what should be a successful exit strategy? Uh, what should that look like? Uh, this is not just for Somalia, but I think at some point we'll have to confront this same kind of question uh, regarding other peace operations that are going on on the continent. How do you deal with unintended consequences of deployments of peacekeepers? And how, in fact, do you protect peacekeepers? How do you protect them? We know that peacekeepers have uh, been at the receiving end of all sorts of things, um, including death. Each of these issues and more, I am convinced. Paul made compelling arguments that anyone who reads it cannot ignore. For me, one of the issues that resonates a lot throughout reading the book is Paul's account of how Amazon's intervention ended up becoming such a long, windy, complex, in fact complicated project involving several institutions, the AU, for instance, providing troops, the UN providing logistic support, the EU providing financing and other forms of support, as well as the role of uh, bilateral partners like the United States and the United Kingdom. It might be that Amazon only decided to kill the proverbial mosquito with a sledgehammer. 
I think that Amazon actually missed, missed the point, thinking that its mandate is essentially about controlling territories, in this case, controlling major towns and cities. It should rather be about the fight, taking the fight to Ashabah, that probably only requires a smaller but more mobile force and is much more intelligent, intelligence, robust, intelligence operation um, model. And I'm saying this because as we begin to contemplate on the exit strategy, uh, people are, there are questions around what, how should we, what should Amazon transform into? Um, and one, for me, reading your book, I'm beginning to think that perhaps Amazon should be thinking of a smaller force, um, much more based on intelligence, that actually goes out of Ashiba. After all, that is the major problem. Fighting, really fighting for peace, therefore for me, left me with a number of questions. And I'd like to raise some of these questions with you so that you can set the tone for the conversation. And for me, the most important of course is, at least today, is what happens to Amazon? What, what's the exit strategy? The first issue for me is around financial sustainability. The issue of financial sustainability has, for instance, become the main consideration consideration behind the pullout. But no one can deny that Somalia is still neck deep in its internal contradictions and regional dynamics. And I'm certain, and I am uncertain, and I think we should reflect on this. What is the actual goal of the AU in Somalia? Can we say with all confidence that fighting against Al-Shabaab or terror should have been the only strategy, strategic goal of Amazon? and by extension, that of the AU. There's also a big problem regarding the role of neighbors in Somalia. And I think this was well captured also in your book. For instance, to what extent the deployment of peacekeepers, mostly drawn from neighboring countries, affect or alter the original goal of the mission? Were the goals of these good intentioned neighbors limited to counter-terrorism alone, or cover broader issues and to what effect? Given the heavy dosage of external involvement in Somalia, for good or bad, what is the weight of extraversion in the African collective security system? Does Amazon impose, in fact, some sort of moral body, a moral hazard, that was not previously anticipated, given the uncertainty of securing full and consistent external support? Given, for instance, the massive US intervention in places like Iraq and Afghanistan, but also other peacekeeping operations on the continent uh, that had challenges. What lessons should we draw, or should the AU in fact draw, in Somalia? With the benefit of hindsight, what kind of control did the AU exercise over its strategy and activities in Somalia through Amazon? Can we in fact say that the various national imperatives that melted into a visible and coherent, has melted into a visible and coherent African strategy. Can one say, without any doubt, that the AU was able to assert an African interest above national interest? The current development in Burundi, just as Amazon in Somalia, showcases that this is not necessarily the case. Let me end my intervention by raising the what next question. What, for instance, is the alternative future not just for Amazon, but also for other peace operations across Africa. Moving forward, the AU could be much more active in non-military security stabilization sector. Uh, and I think we are beginning to, there's a lot of interest in this. What should the AU be doing, you know, uh, not just in terms of confronting national, but in terms of non-military interventions, non-military activities, including stabilizing the security sector. After all, it has done a good work in the stabilization strategy in the Lake Chad Basin uh, to complement the multinational joint task force uh, around, around that region. And it's actually initiating a similar move in the Sahel. Shouldn't we already begin to contemplate such a similar strategy for Somalia, including along its border, border regions, in order to tackle the roots of structural, political, economic, and social issues that is supporting Somali's fragility. It would seem to me that we are now at a critical crossroads. The question that we should be 
uh, reflecting upon uh, is how does the uh, what lessons can we learn from Somalia and Amazon? You know, for such operations such as the MJCF and the G5 Sahel Joint Task Force. This brings me to the need to sort. This brings me to the question of coherence, including among partners, moving forward. Uh, what is the, what is going to be the relationship between the AU and other key partners, not just um, UN and the, a and, and the EU, but also bilaterals? One point that Paul made, and I would like to leave you with this. One point that Paul made um, in his concluding chapter, I believe it's one that should sober all of us up. And here it says that neither Amazon nor the African Union Commission possesses the dedicated capacity for learning lessons. Indeed, according to him, it was only in 2016 that the AUPSC called upon the African Union Commission to conduct a lessons learned process. So imagine an, I mean, an intervention that has taken so many years, and it was only in 2016 that um, a proper call was made to um, catalog lessons learned. Yes, yes, for me, one of the values of glancing into the rear view mirror is to ensure that present and future peace operations are not saddled with the familiar, but mostly ignored mistakes that interventions such as the one in Somalia by Amazon as well. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Charles, for raising those important uh, considerations and a lot of questions. I don't think that Paul can answer all of them, uh, in addition to the Q&A that we'll have now. So in the interest of time, I'll refrain from summarizing and instead take the prerogative to also ask two small questions. Um, the first question is not from me though, it's from a Somali woman peace builder who I work with who lives in one of the sectors where Amazon operates. And she's someone who wouldn't necessarily have the opportunity to be in a forum like this and ask a question, so I'd like to take the opportunity to ask on her behalf and I'll be sure to bring your response back to her. So she's asking, based on your research, how do you think that Amazon community relations can be improved in the immediate? not in a few years, but tomorrow. The top two things that you think can be done concretely now. And my question is, from all the things that you reviewed, I'm sure hundreds and thousands of documents, there are 145,000 words in your book. Um, based on all of that that you looked at, what surprised you the most? What findings surprised you the most? What do you think is in your book that really challenges commonly held assumptions on African peace operations in general, and Amazon in particular. And with that, I'd like to also open the floor for some questions. And we have some ushers around the room. Um, we'll take two questions on this side, and I can't see on the other side, but we have ushers who can see uh, on that side. Um, so I'll take a question there and a question in the back, and then two questions on that side. Unfortunately, I can't give the word, but I, I will um, ask the ushers to give the floor to two people on that side. We'll begin here with Salomon and then the lady in the back in white. And please introduce yourself, ask a question, and be brief. Thank you very much, Anne. Um, can't hear you. Can't hear you. Yes. I wonder how much value, how much attention in the broader debate about Emerson, about the sacrifices that have been made. 
in terms of lives and limbs and what that story tells us about some of the sexes that you have talked about, whether it would have at all been possible for any other mission to accomplish what Emerson accomplished without that willingness to sacrifice in lives and limbs. And I don't know what value we can attach to that sacrifice and whether that is adequately really appreciated uh, in, in, in the debate, such as, for example, when we talk about financing of, of, of the African Union. The second one relates to a point that you raised. It's politics stupid. It's about that point. Writing about Emerson, I remember in 2010, one of the most striking things thing that, that, that was prominent for me was it, two things were required for Emerson. The first one is to change the balance of power, militarily speaking, because Emerson has been on the defensive until that point in time when it started to do, to start the offensive and dislodge Al Shabaab, as you said, in 2011 from the Gwadishu and then, of course, sustain that offensive, counter offensive uh, attack. The second one was the, the, the political dimension of things. The, on the political dimension of things, do you think that there is enough progress that have been achieved? And whether actually in the political front it is the business of Emisom at all, whether this is actually something that the Somalis need to take responsibility for. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Can you introduce yourself very briefly, just your name and your institution? I'm really sorry. I'm terrible at this. I'm Solomon Ayele Derso. I am the founding director of Amani Africa. It's a policy research think tank that works on the African Union. Thank Excellent. you very much, Anna. Thank you, Solomon. Okay, in the back. I have a question to both of you, um, and linking it back to what we've heard yesterday on protection. Um, Paul, you were saying that there were expectations that actually part of the mandate would be protection of civilians, but it wasn't. Um, so basically two questions. Would you think that it should have been, and if, how would that have looked like? Or if you don't think so, how, how could it be, or is it not part of um, the success of a mission to have that part of that mandate or to have it actually as, as the center of the mandate? So, just a bit of more thoughts on the protection uh, of civilians issue, because I didn't hear much on that. Thanks. So uh, there's too many questions there for me to, to tackle all of them, but I, I can pick up on a, a few themes that I think answer um, most of them. That's to do with the neighbors, the levels of sacrifice, uh, protection of civilians and local um, engagement with the local communities. Uh, and I'll start at the end, actually, with civilian protection, because I think that, uh, that leads best so what I think is strange about the Amazon case is if you look at all of the other African Union peace operations, there's been a conscious effort to weave civilian protection into the heart of what the AU does with its peace operations. Whether you look from Burundi, I suppose less so in the Comoros, but Darfur, Mali, Central African Republic, pretty much all of the others, there's been a central factor in terms of um, protecting civilians. Now, Amazon didn't have that. And so in this case, we debated, uh, or well, the, the AU and UN debated whether it should do that. The problems were a couple here. Um, one is that if you give a mission a protection of civilians mandate, you are going to raise both local but also international expectations about what is uh, expected of the peacekeepers. But secondly, if you give a mission this mandate, you've got to give it the capabilities and resources to do this. And I think for that, those second reasons, really, it was probably right that Amazon wasn't given that mandate, at least initially. As one of the um, force commanders put it to me, Prof, you know, we're having enough trouble protecting ourselves, let alone trying to do proactive operations to protect Somali civilians elsewhere. So we've got to remember, for the first four years of Amazon, this was a very bloody war of attrition, urban warfare, whereby civilian protection in the proactive sense of going and inserting yourself in between al-Shabaab forces and civilians would have required a whole other level of capabilities and resources that the mission didn't have. And so I think politically and realistically, if we'd have given the mission that mandate early on, expectations would have been raised, but resources wouldn't have appeared and, and you'd have had a big, a big gap there. I think by the time you get to 2012 onwards, then there's a more serious debate about whether the mission 
should have been given the, uh, the explicit POC um, mandate. But again, the mission would rightly have said, if you give us this additional mandate, we need to have the capabilities and resources to do that. And because of our trouble with force generation, it's not clear to me that those resources would have um, appeared. That helps me answer, hopefully, your, your Somali friend and, and what should Amazon be doing now um, to engage better with local community relations. There's two things, I think, that are key. One is get better at giving information, clear information about what the mission is doing and how it plans to interact with local communities. I think, in my research at least, Somalis have often been bewildered by what they see as quite a mysterious operation. The, the clarity and the nuance about what Amazon's mandate is and what it's there to do has not always filtered out to the local population. So a greater effort to be clear about what they're trying to do is important. And crucially, on the issue of civilian harm, when Amazon has been engaged in actions where civilians have been hurt, wounded, um, abused, or, or killed, there has to be clarity of information and responsibility taken for those issues. And that's to make Amazon, the reason why I say that is it's to make Amazon an authentic voice in the Somali community debates. If you're not seen as an authentic source of information in Somalia, you're in real trouble. And then the second thing that leads to is when we've made mistakes or when Amazon has been involved in civilian harm, we've got to quickly admit that responsibility and make reparations to the local communities. I think that's the only thing that can, can heal some of these wounds. On Solomon's question about sacrifice, yeah, this, as I said at the beginning, this was perceived as mission impossible. And so only Uganda turned up for the first nine months of the mission and then Burundi joined in December uh, of 2007. The level of sacrifice has been huge. Um, I've tried to document as best I can the level of casualties and fatalities that Amazon has suffered, but it's far, far bigger than any other modern peace operation out there. The argument I make in the book is that without those levels of sacrifice and resilience, all the strategic successes that I pointed to at the end just wouldn't have happened. So the argument I make is that it really it's the resilience and sacrifice of Amazon soldiers, initially Ugandans and then joined by Burundian soldiers. It's their resilience, their strength, that has created the strategic successes we've seen later on. In fact, I would say their resilience and strength created these successes despite our strategy. Our strategy of tying Amazon to a transitional government that was perceived widely to be illegitimate was a very difficult mission for Amazon to pursue. So it was that tactical level sacrifice and resilience that, that won the day. And then finally, on the, the neighboring states question, which I think is, is crucial, um, the first point to remember is that in most peace operations, the theory at least says, neighbors are very double-edged swords. Um, Peace operations probably should have more independent and impartial actors. And generally, we've said former colonial powers and neighboring states probably are not the best political contributors to, to peace operations for those reasons. However, if you're not talking about peacekeeping and instead you're talking about war fighting, which is what Amazon was all about, many countries do not want to fight somebody else's war. And Africa, the African Union's members voted with their feet only two countries turned up for the first four years of Amazon, which tells you everything you need to know about the difficulties of, of this mission. And so when you're nearer to the war fighting end of the spectrum, it's really only countries that either have a major national security interest or some other really important political reasons to engage. And that means, as we've seen in the missions against the Lord's Resistance Army, the missions against Boko Haram, the mission in the G5 Sahel now, if you ask countries to do war fighting and not peacekeeping, it's neighboring states that are going to have most vested interest, and it's neighboring states, therefore, that are going to be willing to endure and, as, as we just talked about, sacrifice in order to achieve these objectives. So there's, there's a real dilemma there, and there's not an obvious easy way out of that, um, that conundrum, because as we've seen in Somalia, the frontline states face legitimate national security problems, but by engaging in those things militarily inside Somalia, you generate all sorts of political pushback. And what surprised you the most? Oh, the but um, that's a good question. Uh, two things. One was how um, frank and uh, accessible people were for my research. I couldn't have done this book without getting access from the African Union, the United Nations, the Somali authorities, the US, UK, European Union, and others. So the willingness of people in these organizations to frankly 
discuss what are deeply controversial and difficult issues. I think that surprised me in a positive way. And the second surprise was, I think, just how siloed this mission is. And what I mean by siloed here is information. Very few people see the whole elephant of Amazon. And very few people, uh, as I've come to realize, spend the full 12 years with Amazon. Very few people see all the different component parts of Amazon. Instead, most of the people working on this mission work in particular sections and for particular periods of time. And I think one of the benefits, hopefully, I bring as an academic is that I can spend 12 years or longer looking at this operation. And so it surprised me how compartmentalized information was about this mission. Things that I was finding out from different organizations were not widely shared amongst all the relevant actors. Charles, any parting thoughts? Yeah. I think for me the most important is um, I, I believe that the success of, success of any mission will partly be determined by how it engages with local. And for me, this is not just an important lesson for Amazon in Somalia, but also for other missions across the continent. Um, to, the, to what extent can we say, for instance, today, that local community in Somalia, local communities in Somalia, I mean, continue to see Amazon in a positive light. This is a very big issue. And for once you begin to lose the local community, once you're not able to have their buy-in, you know, in several different respects, then you're already um, um, living on borrowed times. So for me, yes, this, this is a very crucial point about how it engages with local communities. Um, and this, of course, also raises the question around the protection of civilians and um, should it have been part of the mandate? For me, I think that you, we must all understand the situation in Somalia at the time of the first intervention and even throughout. Um, this is a completely different kind of war. It was a fight against a terrorist group and it's not the typical kind of war where you deal with a different scenario. Uh, I'm not making that as an excuse for protection of civilians, but I'm saying that um, it might actually work more in theory than in practice. Uh, finally, the question around staying power of, of missions. I think it all depends on how quickly and how well such missions are able to reinvent themselves and adapt to changing realities. So the point I've raised about what do we do now with Amazon is a very valid one. Shouldn't we, in fact, be thinking of a smaller force that responds directly to terrorists? Because it cannot stay there, continue to stay in Somalia for a long time. It's costing a lot of money. Uh, it's costing a lot of um, debts and so on and so forth, especially of peacekeepers. And we don't want that. So reinventing itself uh, is a major issue. But the question, of course, is in, in reinventing itself, how should it do this and in what direction? Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you to you both. Uh, thank you, Paul, for writing this book. And congratulations again on being Anna Forum's 2019 book. Maybe we can give him a round of applause for this. And uh, thank you, Charles, for providing critical reflections. And Amasak Ganalo to all of you who woke up early uh, to be here with us for this book launch. A final note on how to get the book, which I think everyone has been waiting for. This is the best part. Is the best part. Wait for it. Um, for those of you who asked the question, you will be getting a book, yeah? So being brave and asking a question is good. So take that with you for the rest of the day. Uh? Okay, he can give his away, yeah? You'll share that resource. In addition, there are three additional copies that we want to give in a randomized fashion uh, in the democratic spirit of Tana. So underneath your tables, um, you'll find a ticket for three of you that you can then come and exchange for a book. Um, you can also purchase the book online, and I believe we have a, a, a discount uh, flyer for those of you who want to buy it online. Um, otherwise, look under your table, and you may be the, the lucky winner of, of this book. The next session begins at 9.30 on the ground floor. So until then, please enjoy uh, the lovely Lake Tana. Enjoy yourselves. And thank you so very much. We want to give away all of these, though, yeah? Thank you so much.